but yeah okay well welcome let's let's um start um we've got quite a full agenda i'm just going to share my um screen uh, to let you see the agenda uh one second OK, good. So welcome. Um, my name's uh, Jim Robinson. I'm the co-coordinator of the Global Housing, Land and Property AOR. I'm really pleased to welcome you to this uh, quarterly global meeting. Um, as the name suggests, we have these four times a year and it's a chance to uh, share updates, information, hear about who's doing what, um, sort of build that community of practice around HLP. Um, some of the colleagues here colleagues are here. working oh. on coordination. Um, some of them are, um, you know, interested in HLP uh, in in other ways, either as through policy, academia, or working in uh, shelter cluster, CCCM, other parts of uh, humanitarian programming and development work as well. So you're all very welcome. Um, we're recording the uh, call and um, that will allow us to share uh, the content in the meeting with colleagues who maybe weren't able to join uh, today and for us to to refer back as well. Um, so our agenda today is we're going to have a, a, it's quite a full agenda. We've got some really interesting uh, things to discuss and, to, and updates. Um, like I say, firstly, please do um, introduce yourselves in the chat. Uh, feel free to comment at any point um, you can raise your hand if you would like to comment verbally uh, or leave a comment in the in the chat as well. And if you would like to speak um, in French, we have Trezor here to help with translation. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so please do um, intervene however is comfortable for you. So we will be looking at um, a, a, the Global Refugee Forum is taking place next week. And as you know, we've had um, some work going on around a, a pledge to focus on HLP, so we're going to have an update on that. We're going to hear from colleagues working in Afghanistan, Palestine, Democratic Republic of Congo. We're going to hear an update from colleagues working on shelter and HLP um, and a project looking at cash and HLP. And then we'll also hear from uh, the Global AOR on the information management work that's ongoing. Um, and um, yeah, a couple of updates as well from my side. Um, but yeah, so Please could you uh, mute if you're not speaking? Um, I'll try and spot you and mute you myself, but in case I can't, please do do mute. Um, but first thing is uh, over to Ombretta, who's going to uh, give us a, a brief update on the Global Refugee Forum. Hello, Ombretta. Hi, Jim. Hello, colleagues. Um, Welcome to this meeting. Uh, I'm Ombretta Tempra. I'm the global co-coordinator from the Habitat side together with Jim and uh, it's great to meet you and meet you again, uh, you all. Um, yeah, just briefly, uh, thanks Jim. Um, next week uh, there will be the Global Refugee Forum. I'm sure many of you already heard about it or engaged in it. Um, it's an opportunity to actually, you know, gather and hear all the work going on on the thematic of refugees. And uh, it is also an opportunity uh, for all uh, of us to working on HLP uh, and related aspects to so actually raise the profile and the visibility uh, around this thematic area uh, in relation to refugees, but also a bit more broadly uh, on displaced uh, population, both in uh, countries of origin and uh, country of displacement. Um, uh, we uh, we probably uh, announced it and discussed it briefly uh, already in other meetings, uh, but um, UNHCR, uh, NRC and UN Habitat uh, are co-sponsoring a, a global pledge on housing, land and property rights, um, which uh, is um, 
uh, you know, a, a broader home where many organizations and partners are, uh, you know, uh, coming in and submitting matching pledges as well on the thematic area. Um, the HLP pledge uh, is called Advancing Durable Solution Through Secure Housing, Land and Property Rights. And basically uh, it aims at increasing the proportion of forcibly displaced women, children, men with secure access to housing, land and property in support of sustainable return and reintegration, local integration and other local solution. So quite strongly framed, uh, you know, uh, on, in, on the perspective of durable solution. Um, uh, I think that the information on this pledge is, is available online. We'll also put the link in the chat, uh, but the, uh, there are three areas of focus uh, thematically, you know, restitution of housing, land and properties, housing, land and property rights documentation, and then comprehensive land and tenure security strategies for displaced people. So um we'll be seeing uh, maybe uh, in the coming weeks uh, which partners were interested in that um and also there uh, the pledge uh, got some traction uh, uh, among governments and and member states and perhaps uh, it's important to to note that um, at the global refugee forum the last day on the 15th of december uh, there will be a high level side event on housing land and property rights with where many partners, including ourselves and um, countries as well, uh, will speak about their own pledges on these thematic areas um, and uh, also, um, you know, how they perceive the importance of housing, land and property rights in their own uh, context. Um, the, the, of course, those of you who will be there are welcome to join. It will be at 11. And all the information is on the GRF uh, website, but also the session will be live streamed. Uh, so for those who are interested but are not participating in person, um, it will be possible to follow the discussion there. Um, and with that, I think um, yeah, I will conclude by saying, you know, I'd, we will uh, be able through this process of pledging and GRF to actually, I think, have a broader overview of the work done on HLP by different partners and countries, and maybe have further opportunity of engaging a different level. Uh, also from your side, you know, at the country level, you'll be able also to see online which partners and countries are interested in HLP. So I encourage all of you actually to go on the platform and have a look to see a little bit who is out there and how to create synergies on this thematic area. Um, and with that, thank you so much. And back to you, Jim. Thanks, Ombretta. Yeah, so you can find out the details in there's the link on I put in the chat, which will give you some of the, the details and uh, there might be others that people can share as well. Um, and it might be that um, you, you and your organisation are making a pledge that links to HLP. So please do let us know if uh, if if you would uh, yeah like to share something about that or, or share more about that either here or um, through the global updates, the newsletter that we provide as well. OK, so thank you, Obretta. Um, over to the next item on our agenda. Um, we're going to hear now from colleagues that are working in Afghanistan. Uh, so Ben and Anouk, I'll allow you to introduce yourselves, um, but please yeah, over to you um, for yeah, talking about uh, gender based vulnerability to evictions in Kabul. Um, yeah, Ben and Anouk, over to you. Oh, thanks very much, Jim. Uh, so I'm Ben, uh, Ben Flower from the HLP um, AOR um, in Afghanistan, and I'm here today with our colleague uh, Anouk, who's from the Gender and Humanitarian action uh, working group uh, and also from UN Women. Um, so I think Anouk uh, will share the slides, but um, just to give you a bit of a background. Um, so since August 2021, uh, the de facto authorities um, in Afghanistan have um, uh, had this intention to relocate uh, IDP informal settlements. Uh, and this is particularly the case in Kabul municipality uh, where there are 50 or so informal settlements that the authorities want to evict uh, and return back to their, their place of origin. Um, and the reasoning for it is they say uh, these are conflict displaced people that were granted temporary 
permission to occupy state land. But now the conflict is over. Uh, these people should uh, return to their place of origin. And of course, a lot of these settlements um, are in very high value uh, urban areas um, that uh, de facto authorities uh, want to, to redevelop and uh, and kind of, you know, uh, use for uh, either transport, uh, public infrastructure or, or sell to uh, to developers. Um, so uh, there's been a few evictions that have occurred in recent years. Uh, the most recent one was in July of, of, um, of this year when around uh, 2000 households uh, accounting to something like 15,000 people uh, were evicted. And uh, what we've been seeing is that there are very gendered dimensions uh, to these evictions. Um, and for a whole host of reasons, uh, women um, are both more vulnerable and experience uh, evictions uh, difficulty uh, differently. And that's, of course, um, related to the, the general rollback of, of rights, uh, economic and social uh, rights that we've seen uh, af affecting uh, women in Afghanistan more generally. Um, so in that context, uh, I'll leave it to a nuke uh, to provide um, uh, some insights uh, on these challenges. Great. Thanks so much, Ben. Can I just check that you can all hear me and also see the screen with the PowerPoint? Yes, we hear you well and we see the screen. Yeah, thanks. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for, for giving us a bit of time to present uh, this work today. Um, so as Ben mentioned, um, the idea with uh, with this brief that we've developed also here in the, in the PowerPoint was kind of to add a gender lens um, for in, to this work in order to see specific challenges that are faced by women and girls uh, in communities that are being evicted. So that's often in informal settlements, both in Kabul and in the provinces. So as Ben mentioned, um, this started happening um across the past few years and happened more recently since uh, since the Taliban takeover so that's really something that we wanted to look at from a gender perspective um that's a lot of the work that we do at the gender and humanitarian action working group is to kind of try to add a shed the gender lens on, on some of these issues so that's what we try to do here um so i'll just um share a little bit more on how we did this uh and then we'll go into some of the findings together with ben if that works um so in terms of uh the methodology for this brief and and maybe ben we can share the brief uh with everyone afterwards um the, the link to it at least um we try we built on data that was collected by un habitats uh before the taliban takeover but that was the most recent data for these informal settlements uh in kabul um and then we really tried to to use the gender disaggregation. Uh, thank you so much for sharing the link. Um, the data was gender disaggregated, so we actually uh, were able to extract um, some key issues that were mainly facing women and girls. Uh, here in the PowerPoint, I've also added some of the findings from recent focus group discussion that we also did uh, with women in the informal settlements uh, in Kabul. So we'll also also present that a little bit. Um, so looking really at gender vulnerabilities, as Ben was saying, um, due to the current situation in Afghanistan, and I'm sure uh, this group is, is very well aware of the situation where we have uh, many directives and decrees that are specifically targeting um, women and girls in Afghanistan. Oops, I lost the presentation. Uh, let me just try to share again. Um, all right, it's coming back. I'll just give it a second. Um, but just to to come back a bit on the context, we do have a lot of um, of directives that are directly impacting uh, women and girls, and of course, that has an impact on how we provide assistance and how vulnerable women are uh, when trying to receive humanitarian assistance, uh, including in the case of evictions. So. I'm sure you're all aware of so of the the ban that happened last year. Um, in December of women NGO workers and that was uh, also extended to women working with the UN afterwards uh, that creates a lot of difficulties in our ability to reach women. Um, so that's a little bit for the context. So when it comes to informal settlements, 
Um, what we noticed together with the HLP task force is that um, women who live uh, in the settlements really rely heavily on community networks um, to get information and assistance. Um, that's in many cases because women in Afghanistan really have issues in uh, interacting directly with men. So it's a lot easier for them to interact with women. Um, but now in many instances, we also don't have enough women's staff or we face challenging challenges for women's staff to also uh, be there to interact with women. So we find that women tend to really rely on networks of people that they know, mostly other women, to get information and assistance. Um, the issue with this during eviction is that these networks are really at risk of disappearing entirely for women. We noticed that women in the informal settlements were a lot more informed about assistance than women outside of the settlements. And our assumption is that because they're able to get information from these networks, then they're better able to get information on the assistance and to get the assistance. So you had 40% uh, of, of women in informal settlements uh, that were informed about assistance versus 25% of women in host communities. Um, so as I was saying, really the evictions um, put a risk on, on these networks uh, and could create uh, many risks in terms of women being completely left out uh, of assistance. And the informal settlements in, in Kabul and in the provinces in Afghanistan, we also have a lot of women-headed households. And so these households are even more at risk of not getting any information at all on the assistance being provided because they don't have male relatives that could go around and, and get this information from them for them in a context where a lot of them are staying inside a lot of the time because it's um, with the restrictions. Uh, and requirements for male guardians, it's really hard for them to, to move around. Um, so here you can see a quote also from displaced women in Kabul saying we're comfortable speaking to people in our community and in our family. If I have a problem, I'll speak to my neighbors and my brother. We know each other and we'll help each other. Um, so that's a bit on these networks. Um, and then another important element is really on the protection side. Um, we're seeing that population in informal settlements are already more likely to use negative coping mechanisms. And so this includes child labor that often targets uh, boys more often and early marriage of, of daughters that's, uh, that's, that's targeting girls. Um, often these uh, coping mechanisms are really used as a protection mechanism or people see them as such, um, especially for the early marriage of daughters. Um, I think a risk that we're seeing with the eviction is that this this situation in terms of protection issues could potentially get worse. So right now, as we were mentioning, there were networks that are in place that are able to, to some extent, create um, also protection mechanism for women, women-headed households and girls in the community. Uh, without this next work and, and with the impact also on the household's economic situation, which Ben will will touch on, um, this may create more protection concerns. Um, there's a quote here from this place woman in Kabul saying, uh, girls don't feel safe in town because they might face safe problems and harassment cases. That's why most of these parents are willing to accept their premature marriage. We have no door or walls in a tent and keeping daughters in this tent is unsafe. That's why it would be better to accept such a premature marriage because it can also help us economically because we can charge a certain amount of money for our girls. Um, so that's a bit the logic that we're seeing in terms of this protection mechanism. Uh, and again, when it comes to protection, another issue that we we're seeing in the informal settlement is access to identification, uh, which is much lower for women. So as you can see here, uh, compared to men. So that's also something that's impacting services and that in case of eviction would also mean probably less access to services because we still have um, many both humanitarian and more development partners that require uh, identification in many instances. Um, and this uh, this prevents women then from, from getting assistance. Uh, it also prevents women from really interacting with the broader formal system. Uh, which they would need to do if they were to resettle somewhere. Um, that's already something that's more difficult for women because the system is mostly now uh, made of men, civil servants, so they would need to interact with men. 
uh, well, they're also not often allowed in government buildings, so it's uh, also creating a complicated situation for them. So I'll stop here and I'll hand to Ben to talk a little bit more about the economic situation. Well, thanks, Anouk. Yeah, I'll just go uh, uh, fairly quickly through these, I think. Um, so, yeah, so the so the one key finding is that there's, um, you know, um, a very uh, big difference between the economic situation of male headed and female headed households. Uh, more often we see uh, female headed household in, in the lowest income bracket. That's uh, earning uh, less than uh, a thousand Fs a month, which is a very low income of around twenty dollars or or something like that. Uh, it's, it's very low, uh, and that's for, and that's for the the household um, far before uh, far below the the average per capita GDP of Afghanistan, which in itself is one of the lowest on earth. So this has a number of implications from a from a kind of um, HLP lens. Uh, if women are evicted, female-headed households will have far less capital resources to be able to find alternative accommodation. Um, so they're far more likely to um, either go to uh, other informal settlements uh, and squat or, or other uh, peripheral uh, uh, unsafe areas of land um, where they can find accommodation, where they will, where they, where they can erect their, their temporary uh, accommodation. Um, so that, and then moving on to the uh, the livelihoods um, aspect of it. Um, again, looking at the the broader picture in Afghanistan of women having restricted access to public space, um, it's very notable that um, a lot of the female-headed households' primary livelihood uh, activity is based on the public space. For example, um, unskilled labour, uh, female-headed households, and, and women in general. Um, uh, are um, uh, relying on, um, you know, um, accessing, uh, on, uh, you know, um, informal labour um, in public spaces uh, to uh, derive an income. Even 12.5% of women-headed households' primary source of income was from um, begging on, on the streets. Uh, and of course, these activities um, in themselves are extremely uh, vulnerable to disruption um, based on any number of factors, for example, you know, um, uh, adverse weather or or um, climate shocks, but also in the broader context of the of, of the rollback on on women's rights, it means that uh, um, that, that, that women's income streams in informal settlements uh, render them highly vulnerable to evictions. And in the case where they they are evicted, they may find it difficult to re-establish informal economic um, networks. Uh, that, that enable them to um, to derive um, a livelihood, um, and this is particularly the case, as I say, in 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 the context of uh, post uh, 2021 uh, Afghanistan. Um, and then moving on to the next slide. So yeah, so so th so these are basically um, the outcomes um, from an economic perspective of evictions. It means it's going to be particularly severe for women, both women in male headed households and, and particularly for women headed households, uh, because once they've been um, evicted and we have to remember that these informal settlements are very centrally located, um, they're close to uh, these informal livelihoods um, uh, and, and also they're very um, established. Um, a lot of these informal settlements that are due to be evicted um, have been there for 10 or 20 years, over 50 percent have been over over 10 years. Um, so these informal economic networks have been very important for for for, for women um, headed households. Um, and in the absence of these, and I think as Anouk mentioned, uh, it's very likely um, that women uh, headed households, uh, uh, once they have been evicted and they're in a peripheral location without access to the informal networks that they relied on, uh, they are likely to uh, to uh, lead to uh, negative coping mechanisms. And we've seen um, a lot of those um, in Afghanistan that's been documented by Jihad and others. Um, so just moving on to the, the next slide. So yeah, so um, you can peruse these in more detail in the brief, which uh, Jim very um, kindly linked to. So I think some of the main recommendations from our report, we've looked at the immediate impacts of evictions. 
And so immediate impacts of evictions, um, we've seen how important it is to have disaggregated household survey data so that we're able to understand uh, the particular vulnerabilities uh, faced by women and human humanitarian um, humanitarian partners are able to um, address those needs um, once they know what they are. And a key aspect of this uh, we have found in, in Afghanistan is the need for um, for women humanitarian workers to have access to these sites, and that's because of the uh, the cultural models of gender that that Anouk spoke about, which means that um, women find it very difficult to uh, interact with with male humanitarian workers and also access information about uh, humanitarian services um, if there are no women uh, humanitarian workers to provide those those um, those messages and that information. Um, and another thing. Uh, that's crucial is cash, uh, cash interventions. Um, when women are evicted um, with nowhere to go, uh, uh, they need cash to be able to to rent um, accommodation and uh, link to that uh, some of the you know the work of ICLA and, and others about rental um, rental uh, agreements so that the the rental rights of women headed households are protected and they can't be evicted from um, from. Uh, their their rental accommodation. That's again a very gender specific protection concern. And then moving forward into the medium term for the for the durable solutions aspects. Um, again, we found that you know um, it's it's crucial that, that women headed households, in particular, of course, male headed households too, but particularly because of the economic profile of the women headed households, it's crucial that they remain uh, linked to the urban centres. In, in which they have developed these economic networks. So in in the event we strongly advocate for authorities not to evict um, uh, households uh, in general. And if they do, it's 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 crucial that they um that they uh, provide alternative settlement sites in urban areas close to livelihoods and provide livelihood support. And um, we've also provided some guidance uh, on international and domestic uh, uh, um, frameworks for um, resettlement in Afghanistan um, and that can also be uh, we can also share that with you later if interested. Um, so that's all from us. Uh, thanks very much and uh, look forward to any questions. Thanks Ben, thanks Anouk. That's um, yeah really interesting and, and great to see the links being made between um, gender and evictions and the risk of eviction that we kind of know are there but don't always see kind of um, analysed in, in such a, a sort of a, a comprehensive way. So thank you um, for putting that together. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments for uh, Ben and Anouk? Carol, please, yeah, come in. Thanks so much, Jim, and thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, I, I was wondering if you have any evidence or information around, so, so clearly I think we understand positive benefits of providing a combination of housing rights plus cash uh, to support women in situations like this. Do you have any information though on um, women's ability to control the cash? Is there any concern that in fact it's challenging for them to keep keep um yeah to keep control of cash transfers? I think a pretty narrow question. Thank you so much. And I really appreciated the presentation. Thanks, Carol. Um, yeah, Ben, Anouk, any um well, actually, any other questions? If there's others, we can take them as a group. OK, so maybe Ben, Anouk, if you'd like to, to respond to that question um, about uh, evidence around women's ability to control cash. So, uh, yeah, if that, if that has a an angle to it that we need to be aware of. Sure, thanks so much. Maybe I can take that and Ben, if you want to, to come in and compliment. Uh, I think generally in Afghanistan, cash is the preferred modality to get assistance, and that's across both uh, women and men um, due to challenges in, in 
um, sometimes and in, in being able to get also the right assistance. So for women, a lot of times we hear that they don't get gender responsive assistance, so they prefer to get it uh, for cash and buy it themselves. So that includes, for instance, um, um, dignity kits or other products that women would use. Uh, in terms of their ability to keep the cash, I think that really depends on different regions. So we're seeing um, recently, for instance, with the, the earthquake that happened in Herat, we saw some distribution of cash to women inside men-headed households uh, that, uh, that went, I think, really well, um, and where women were able to keep the cash. Um, in other instances, however, and I'm thinking specifically of the south of Afghanistan, where it's a lot more conservative, uh, it's really difficult for women to even come to a cash distribution. Um, and in these cases, uh, it would often be, or most of the time, be the men in the households that would that would come and get the cash. Uh, in the case of women-headed households, we're seeing that these households are actually uh, able to come to distribution and uh, because there's no men in the households to keep the cash and use it. So it's really these households that I think um, actors should really try to, to target. Uh, but then if you want to add as well. Oh, nothing to add from my side. I think uh, you covered it all there, Anup. OK, thanks both. Um, great, thanks. If anyone else has other comments or questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat or um, yeah, or raise your hand and, and come in. That would be that would be great. Um, but yeah, thanks again, uh, Ben Anouk and Anouk. Sorry, um, I'll put the link, as you see, to the uh, the briefing in the chat so people please have a, a look and I'm sure they would welcome feedback and sharing and comment and uh, other things as well. Um, Carol your hand's still raised I just want to check if that's uh, a new comment or if if you um, nope, nope. Uh, it let was me, just raised from okay. no no it's fine don't worry. thank you thank you um, okay thanks and so on to the next item in the agenda is um, to have an update on um, the, some of the HLP violations we're seeing in in Gaza and West Bank, Palestine. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have been, um, yeah, watching with kind of horror at, at how things are playing out there, and um, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, trying to consider and work out how we might respond as HLP uh, practitioners. Um, so yeah, thought it'd be great to hear from colleagues who are working in that area to understand a little bit more. Um, so uh, Nada. Um, I think you're online. Um, please, yeah. yeah, introduce yourself, and then over to you for a brief update. And if people would like to, um, yeah, respond or comment, then then can come in afterwards. Uh, but yeah, Nader, over to you. All right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, my name is Nader Mwadi, and I'm the um, West Bank Legal Task Force Coordinator. Uh, also, following up with uh, HLP issues that are taking place right now in Gaza. So many thanks, Jim, for providing me with this opportunity. Um, Regarding what's happening in the Gaza Strip, we're seeing wanton destruction and displacement. Um, according to the Palestinian Ministry of Public Works and Housing in Gaza, 90% uh, of the structures that are being targeted in airstrikes and by uh, artillery are residential structures. Um, according to the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics, uh, since October 7th, Israel has essentially damaged 252,000 housing units and destroyed completely uh, 50,450, rendering them uninhabitable. Um, together, I mean, this figure of about 3,000 housing units, 300,000, sorry, uh, constitutes about 50% of all housing stock in Gaza. Um, in addition to houses, 70% of commercial uh, facilities have been damaged or destroyed. 47% uh, of the roads have been damaged or destroyed. 67% of health facilities have been damaged or destroyed. 59% um, of all educational facilities have also been impacted, with 316 being damaged and 197 being destroyed. Um, also, 50% of all wash facilities have been damaged and destroyed. Um, essentially, 85% of the population, 1.9 million people out of 2.2 .2 to 2.3 million uh, people, are now internally displaced people. Uh, 1.2 million are currently living in UNRWA honor facilities, which are overcrowded and have a whole bunch of problems and are also being targeted by uh, Israeli airstrikes. Uh, so far, UNRWA has also distributed hundreds of tents, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the humanitarian aid that's trickling into Gaza is insufficient. 
uh, it's not enough, it's not being allowed, and there's many obstacles to getting uh, material assistance into the Strip. And right now, 500,000 people still have no shelters, and they're unprotected from the elements, let alone the airstrikes. Um, it's worth noting that due to overcrowding and poor sanitary conditions at UNRWA shelters, um, there's been a significant increase in diseases and conditions such as diarrhea, acute respiratory infections, skin infections, hygiene-related conditions like lice, and there's also initial reports about an outbreak of hepatitis A. Um, people with disabilities, women who are pregnant, uh, who have recently given birth or are breastfeeding, as well as people recovering from injuries, which are thousands, um, and those with compromised immune systems are especially at risk. Um, the World Health Organization documented at least 212 attacks on healthcare facilities in the Gaza Strip, affecting 56 healthcare facilities, including 24 hospitals and 19 ambulance, 59 ambulances. Um, currently, only 14 out of the 36 hospitals in the Gaza Strip are actually functional anymore, and even those that are functional have a very limited, reduced capacity. Um, due to the lack of medical supplies and, and equipment uh, that have been allowed into the Strip. Moreover, since October 11th, um, Israeli authorities have essentially cut off the electricity supply to Gaza, and the fuel reserves uh, for Gaza Sol power plant are being depleted, or have been depleted, although a tiny bit has recently begun to trickle in, but still, I mean, blackouts are the norm. Uh, as I said before, what we're seeing is wanton destruction, mass force displacement at an unprecedented level. Um, the Gaza Strip is effectively being destroyed in its entirety, and there's no real safe space for civilians. Um, we expect that people uh, will be largely living in transitional housing for the next five to eight years. Um, and right now, uh, we're in the process of setting up a legal task force in Gaza. Um, initially, we had envisioned that it would you know, be... Um, during the, the post-war reconstruction process, it would be there would be a, a need for a legal task force so as to assist with them protecting people's housing land and property rights, and also to play an advisory role for shelter and wash interventions. But now it's also become um, increasingly urgent for an immediate uh, legal uh, response in the Gaza Strip, as many people uh, lack civilian documentation, and without that documentation, they cannot, you know. Uh, or take in medical evacuations, nor can they engage in a banking system. They can't even buy a SIM card. And oftentimes, the lack of civilian documentation also prevents access to humanitarian assistance. Um, so that's the very grave situation taking place in Gaza in, in a very brief nutshell, not doing true justice to the, the severity of the atrocities that are taking place there. Um, it's also worth noting, as you said, uh, that a lot of displacement is happening in the West Bank right now. Um, in the West Bank, we already have a well-established legal task force that's been in place for several years now, albeit we've switched the modalities since October 7th. We're meeting more regularly, more frequently um, on a bi-weekly basis, but we're also holding a lot of bilateral discussions too. Um, essentially, while international attention has been focused on Gaza, uh, since October 7th, Israel has demolished 223 structures in the West Bank, uh, including 112 uh, residential structures, 18 agricultural structures, 29 livelihood structures, livelihood structures and 25 wash structures, um, 37 infrastructure installments, and two other structures. Um, this has resulted in the forced displacement of 124 households, consisting of 623 people, including 300 children. Um, it's also uh, affected an additional 1,900 households, uh, consisting of about 215,000 people and 94,000 children. Um, and the reason that the number of people that are affected is so great in comparison to those who have been displaced is that most of these demolitions are occurring within the context of military operations. And during these military operations, there is um, vast damage that is intentionally carried out against civilian infrastructure. And that includes um, basically unearthing roads and in doing that process with large bulldozers, they also destroy the water networks, the sewage networks, um, the electrical networks, creating blackouts, um, uh, creating water cuts. Um, so that's essentially the, the situation that's taking place right now. In Area C, which is like the rural outskirts of the West Bank, um, where there's many Bedouin and herder communities that have been uh, at risk of uh, forced displacement for, for decades now, we've been working to support them. Um, that area constitutes the majority of the West Bank, about 60%, and it's both under Israeli administrative and security control. In that area, um, 
demolitions by the state have largely subsided because those demolitions are carried out on the basis of illegal construction, albeit Israel does not grant Palestinians in those areas with building permits, so they're forced to build illegally. Um, however, it's largely subsided, even though there's not a official freeze on demolitions, but simply because the military carries out those demolitions and they're spread thin with the current war. Um, nonetheless, in East Jerusalem, where demolitions are carried out by the municipality, uh, we've seen demolitions continue um, as they were prior to October 7th. Um, and we're even worried now that while international attention is focused on what's happening in Gaza, and rightfully so, um, that you know they will start to carry out demolitions in sensitive areas, um, which they have not been able to do in the past due to diplomatic pressure and, and red tape. Um, it's also worth noting that Israel during this period carried out 17 punitive demolitions, which basically are an act of collective punishment as they target um, the family members of uh, people who've carried out alleged attacks against Israeli uh, soldiers or citizens. Um, and also there's been 22 forced self-demolitions in East Jerusalem. And the forced self-demolition is a recent phenomenon in recent years that came about um, because of some changes in the Israeli planning and building law, which basically imposes draconian measures that can basically put people at risk of being jailed or to pay large sums um, for building illegally, despite the fact, as I said before, that they are not able to build legally. Um, it's also worth noting that during this period, we've seen an exponential increase um, basically in pogrom attacks on communities uh, by Israeli settlers that have also contributed to forcible transfer. Um, and in this case, we've seen since October 7th, uh, 21 communities, villages, um, in this area that I described, this, this rural area called Area C, which is dotted by very small Bedouin herder communities. Um, and it actually resulted in the displacement of 188 Palestinian households, in addition to the figures that I already mentioned, consisting of about 1,200 people, including about 600 uh, children who have been either fully or partially forcibly transferred since October 7th, basically due to an onslaught of uh, settler violence by these uh, Israeli settlers. Um, so that's essentially the situation in short in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, and I mean, right now we're meeting on a, on a regular basis to see how we can, you know, formulate legal responses uh, to this very drastic situation. Um, and I'd be more than happy to address any questions that anyone may have. Thanks, Nada, for that update. Um, yeah, colleagues, if you would like to uh, react, comment, um, please. Um, either you can use the chat or, or raise your hand. Um, dear, I don't know if you wanted to add anything at this point or if. Uh, um. No, not really. I was hoping that maybe okay. we will have some questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, one thing to just say that, um, you know, uh, with this kind of situation, so what we're we're trying to support with as well is thinking about how to um, respond in the coming weeks and months and We've been having discussions with colleagues about what that might look like from an HLP coordination side. Like Nada mentioned, the uh, legal task force and the work that that can do on legal issues that are related to HLP, but also relating to civil documentation and all sorts of other um, really essential aspects as well. Another thing we're looking at is some kind of HLP technical working group that will act as a, a kind of a practical interface between um, those that are working on um, you know, material provision around shelter, wash and across the different clusters and, and, and the response as it develops with some of those, um, you know, specific HLP um, issues that we know come up. So around due diligence, of, of course, and, and other things as well. Um, so, yeah, so that's something we're working on as well, as well as trying to develop some advocacy around this and trying to work out what's the, uh, you know, how can we be smart and effective in how we respond? And, and you yeah, know, it's a very difficult situation. So if colleagues, you have uh, questions or ideas, of course, um, please do share. Um, I think, Stephanie, I think I saw your hand raised. Please do come in, Stephanie, and maybe introduce yourself yes, as well I thought, when, you, when you do. Hi, my name is Stephanie from the Global Shelter Cluster, and I also just wanted to give everybody the impression that, yes, we are really listening, even though there are not many questions coming up, uh, as you might wish for, we are there. Um, I just wanted to ask, do you have any idea where so many, like, um, housing units destroyed, I mean, as you said, it'll it'll take several years until those are built up. But do you have any sort of indication, first of all, how many people were renters before? Because, I mean, it's a completely urban setting, so not everybody's like a house owner. 
in in Gaza, um, and specifically like how um, how the documentation of HLP rights of of you know like the ownership or also the rental agreements were actually official, so that you can or, you know like registered or um, if there were a lot of or how the percentage is on let's say informal rental agreements, which be of course much more difficult to follow up at some point. Yeah, I, I don't have figures on rent, um, but I mean, this isn't the first war that we've experienced that has resulted in mass destruction. I mean, this is on an unprecedented level, but we've had um, similar smaller scale attacks on Gaza in the past. And the reconstruction process is always very complicated um, because HLP rights are vast. And I mean, we have issues, for example, where um, you have many widows who sometimes are denied inheritance rights and they need to be guaranteed those rights. You have many orphans who also need to have their rights protected um, in terms of inheritance rights. Um, a lot of documentation is lost and, um, you know, even not only by the families, but also by the archives, which are also destroyed. Um, and then you have to create new means of where people can have witnesses to verify and fact check that they are indeed the owners of certain properties. Um, so it creates a whole bunch of issues around tenancy and ownership. Um, that's a very complicated issue, but um, I mean, essentially, that's what we try to do post-war. I mean, that's why uh, it's going to involve a very um, comprehensive legal aid response, with a lot of paralegal work and legal information to be disseminated uh, for people to guarantee their, their rights and to ensure that we don't do any harm. Um, to potential uh, people who do, you know, who are rights holders, whether uh, they're tenants or owners of properties. Um, Dia, would you like to, to, is that fair? Or would you, uh, how would you add something to that, maybe? I can add, I think uh, that Fatma also raised her uh -huh. hand, like our colleague Fatma from Gaza, and uh, she also raised her hand. But just to add that uh, just before the war, we were working uh, with our shelter colleagues on um, uh, rent agreements. It's estimated that around 10% of population in Gaza was renting. We are talking about, because it's a, such a small, like it's a condensed community. It's a, I mean, it's an urban setting, but it's nevertheless, um, people are related. We are talking about that these 10% are the most, really the most vulnerable communities. They're basically not having any support. Um, and uh, even in the past, it was a challenge. It was it was a huge issue, but now it's going to be very different. I think the situation now is completely different. Nothing is like before uh, last month. So we will see how it works. And Fatma, I think, wanted to say a few words. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Nader and Dia, for the comprehensive briefing about the uh, HLB issues on Gaza. Actually, we need to consider uh, the different classification for the land on Gaza. We have uh, old legal framework agreements since Ottoman mandate, which is on 1985. And we have different regulations from Egyptian mandate than from Palestinian mandate. We have different kind of land, which is Waqf land, private land, Tabu land, settlement land, and land which is not settlement until now, as well as we have state land. So some people, they are living inside the state land and they are living inside work of land, while the others or the most majority, they have a private land. And we have extended families inside Gaza, which, is, which we are talking about uh, industrial uh, building. And it's more than يعني, six up to eight floors on each building, which is destroyed or major damaged. In addition, for, for what Nader mentions, we have a lot of inheritance issues, as well as we have a project housing that built by UNRWA or Ministry of Work and Housing um, and other donors. From the experience that we have before as an RC, as an RC only who has the expertise on working on HLP issues on Gaza Strip before, since 2009 until um, the last escalation in two, uh, 2021, um, it was difficult for the people to secure their legal documentation and it was different uh, approach and different agreement agreement either with the local authority UNRWA and UNOPS to manage and to do uh, the due diligence 
for each building and for each beneficiary to enable them to be eligible for uh, receiving the construction grant. Unfortunately, even if there is a lot of efforts from um, international organization and UN organization to support the people to have shelter, the shelter will not be remaining as before because they will have some standards for providing only shelter, not to rebuild the, the building as being before the escalation or before the conflict. So even uh, Israeli side, the Israeli authority, they impose different uh, system and different measures to enter the goods and material to gather strap on each escalation. They have to, to do security clearance and fitting and to agree on the quantity and POQ for each building with UNRWA and with the other UN agencies before entering the materials to Gaza, which will be, I mean, if you are talking about uh, 2014 or 2009, uh, the reconstruction process, it's take more than seven years. And we are talking about massive destructive now. So we need to consider all this process, the legal documentation, it shall be documentation that distracted for land authority now. And most of the people, they are lost their legal documentation and even the private lawyer offices were destroyed and we will have a massive needs uh, to support on securing legal document uh, documentation as well as the uh, boundary between the lands and building it's destroyed and the people they need a lot of a work to to make sure that they are the right actually be uh, actually be right holders for the uh, pellet of land or piece of land as well as there is a lot of people they are killed and we have to be considered that the court system should be in a place especially sharia court to um, issues inheritance deed and legal identity for the people, as well as not only it would be on parallel for having legal documentation. So it would be take a lot of time. It would be need not only technical expertise, but we need legal expertise to do all this work in the future. In addition to support shelter actors and shelter cluster on doing the technical side and making sure they are understanding what the requisition for each repair. If we are talking about damage repair or a, a minor a minor damage or uh, totally damaged or uh, totally destroyed. So we, we need to uh, differences between all these kind of work. We need to have um, a guideline and to uh, have different uh, kind of work about what we have do before, as well as we need to have due diligence guideline and to make sure that even the local authority will be a part of any HLB technical working group or area of responsibility on the future to have a coordination of efforts uh, to respond for this um, massive destructive on a proper way. Thank you, Fatma. Thank you, colleagues. Um, we're going to um, have to move on, I'm afraid, with the, the agenda, but I just want to note there's a question there. Someone's asked about um, advocacy around compensation and reparation. So maybe one of you can try and write an answer in the chat or, or, or someone else on the call might have some ideas around that as well, because I think it's a yeah a massive question. And um, and of course, one that we've seen come up sometimes in other contexts as well. People start thinking to the to the future and what is this going to mean and how are we going to advocate for people to um, yeah, receive the yeah, or experience the restitution that they that they must. So, um, yeah, thank you, colleagues, for joining. And um, yes, and this will be a, a topic I'm sure we will discuss again in the coming months. And um, um, and let's yeah, keep keep working together and trying to find ways to 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 respond. Um, thanks. Um, going to turn now to our colleague working in De Democratic Republic of Congo, um, Pascal Shikula, um, who's going to give us a, a short update on on some of the work there and also uh, discuss a couple of briefing notes that have been produced as well. And, and Trezor is going to assist with uh, translation. So uh, Trezor, Pascal, um, over to, to you. Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. Hi, Pascal. Hi. OK, as you say, I'm going to speak in French. 
Ok, I'm going to share my screen. Je ne sais pas si, euh, si Trésor est en mesure de le partager ou moi je vais le faire à mon niveau parce que je vais partager le, le document. Trésor, c'est possible de le partager? Oui, si tu veux, je vais partager. D'accord. Okay. Merci. Mon, donc, mon briefing va porter sur la note de plaidoyer que nous avions produite. Et elle a été faite dans le but de rehausser les profils de la visibilité des problèmes LTP en RDC. Et donc, avant de parler du contenu de cette note, je voulais présenter dans un premier temps comment est-ce que nous organisons et comment est-ce que nous fonctionnons au niveau de la RDC. Donc, comment est-ce que le GTLTP fonctionne? C'est cela le premier slide. Et le deuxième slide, ce sera l'exposé sur la note de plaidoyer, qu'est-ce que ça contient, pour quelle vision nous l'avions produite. À vous. Pascal Chikara, je voudrais que tu présentes une invocation de Fredi ici. But uh, before before uh, presenting the advocation, he would first uh, present uh, the national HLP uh, in DRC, the way uh, it works. Okay, donc uh, en RDC, le groupe de travail LTP travaille au sein du cluster protection, différemment des autres pays, parce que j'ai constaté que dans d'autres pays, le GTLTP réunit le membre de plusieurs clusters, non, dont le cluster protection, cluster abri, cluster CCCM et cluster CECAL. Donc, contrairement à ce pays, en RDC, nous nous dépendons où nous sommes le membre essentiellement du cluster protection. So, uh, it's, it might be different in, in other countries, but in DRC, Uh, the housing land and property is under uh, the protection class. Donc, au niveau national, comme vous le voyez, nous fonctionnons, mais dans les hubs, hubs humanitaires, ce sont des zones géographiquement euh, humanitaires, et elles sont au nombre de sept. Là également, il y a des points focaux LTP, mais qui sont essentiellement des agents ICLA de NRC. So, so there is an established uh, coordination at national level uh, for, for housing, land and property, but in sub-national level, um, there are uh, seven focal points uh, who, who uh, coordinate uh, HLP, but most of them are NRC uh, staff and they, they have a uh, ICRA profile. Donc, dans ce hub, que nous appelons zone opérationnelle, les acteurs qui sont essentiellement dans les groupes de travail, ce sont les ONG nationales, quelques ONG internationales, mais qui œuvrent dans le secteur humanitaire et aussi quelques services étatiques. Au revoir. So, in, in most of those uh, subnational regions or hubs, uh, most of, of uh, participants in in those groups are uh, local NGOs, uh, international NGOs, and sometimes uh, government uh, focal, focal persons. OK. Maintenant, euh, je veux parler de l'implication de notre groupe de travail dans le processus d'élaboration des outils de programmation humanitaire. Et comme vous le voyez dans un premier temps, Lorsqu'il s'agit de faire les travaux d'analyse des besoins, notre groupe de travail est impliqué dans la priorisation des besoins selon les zones de santé. Et aussi, en deuxième lieu, lorsqu'on élabore maintenant le plan de réponse humanitaire, nous sommes impliqués dans la définition de la méthodologie, des activités et même des coûts. Et maintenant, ce qui est surprenant, c'est que Lorsque maintenant il y a des fonds qui sont annoncés en guise de réponse à ces, à, à, à ces besoins identifiés, que ce soit des fonds humanitaires, des fonds CERF ou des fonds de réserve, l'on n'arrive pas à considérer les besoins LTP comme faisant partie intégrante de la réponse. Alors que 
Lorsqu'il s'agit de faire les reporting dans les 3V, 6W et dans le dashboard, on ne cesse de nous demander de, de donner, de rapporter sur notre présence opérationnelle, sur notre réponse, alors que lorsqu'il s'agit de voter des allocations, le LTP est entièrement occulté. Au revoir. Uh, thank you, Pascal. So, you were saying that um, in planning phases or during the humanitarian uh, program cycle, uh, such as uh, uh, needs assessment or um, the setup of uh, humanitarian uh, response plan, most of the time uh, HLP is uh, is in those uh, pro uh, activities. So it means that uh, HLP might be present in those uh, activities, is being uh, considered in, in assessment and in uh, the setup of uh, the humanitarian uh, response plan. But now, uh, when it comes to the funding, uh, funding process such as uh, funding mechanism, such as uh, uh, humanitarian fund, uh, self, and so on, uh, most of the time uh, HLP is not being considered and this is due to the fact that um, uh, HLP is, is not uh, sometime uh, OCHA does, does not consider HLP as life uh, saving. Ok, donc vous venez de finir sur ce que je voulais ajouter. Donc le, les raisons qui sont avancées lorsque on met de côté la réponse LTP, c'est qu'on dit que la plupart des actions de réponse ne sont pas du type life saving. Et on a observé cela lorsqu'il y a eu le plan de réponse à la crise des inondations de Calais et au sud Kivu, où il y avait un projet axé sur la construction des abris en faveur des sinistrés. Et maintenant, on s'est rendu compte peu après que la mise en œuvre de ces projets dépendait d'abord de la mise à disposition d'un terrain où on va construire. Et qui devrait faire ce travail, c'est l'LTP. Et malheureusement, parce que nous n'étions pas dans la réponse, je vous assure, ce projet jusque-là a connu un échec. Même chose dans la crise de Kwamut, dans la province de Maïndombe, où il y a eu le fonds de réserve au mois de juin, on avait aussi occulté le LTP, et voilà tout ce qui a été fait, c'est l'assistance aux sinistrés, oubliant que c'est la crise foncière qui a été à la base de tous les déplacements. En rapport avec le plan de réponse M23, Là, je ne vais pas évoquer beaucoup de choses. Au niveau de Goma, on est en train de construire des sites, de déplacer, malheureusement sur des terrains à problème. Et donc, face à ce bilan, nous avions produit une note d'information pour faire un cri de, de détresse, pour alerter sur les retombées de cette façon de faire. Au revoir. Okay, uh, thank you, Pascal. So, you were saying that... Um Uh, so, considering the, the fact that uh, HLP is being uh, excluded in most of uh, funding uh, mechanism, so there are uh, some projects uh, that are on risk because it did not, uh, uh, because even when discussions was about uh, setting up those projects, those project HLP was not uh, included, and then uh, those projects are facing uh, the a lot of uh, HLP, HLP uh, issues, and even uh, there is uh, one project uh, that has has uh, has built some some um, temporary uh, uh, tent in the place uh, that has a lot of uh, uh, problem, a lot of issues. Okay, maintenant il y a d'autres provinces qui étaient en, uh, récemment classé dans la phase de stabilisation avec le fameux Nexus. Comme à Nitouri, on est en train de développer maintenant l'approche des solutions durables. Encore une fois, le LTP n'est pas visible. Et malheureusement, le HCR et le PNU de qui gère ce fonds, qui devrait cette fois-ci recourir aux acteurs du, du GTLTP dans la mise en œuvre des activités en lien avec le LTP, Malheureusement, ces deux organisations, essentiellement le HCR, a recouru à un acteur qui n'est pas du GTLTP. Et donc, on se demande finalement, est-ce que c'est la stabilisation lorsque on prend des acteurs qui n'ont pas d'expertise à la matière? Au revoir. 
and and there is an ongoing uh, process uh, to um, in line with the durable uh, solution but the hlp was uh, surprised that uh, a partner who uh, was considered for, for that is not even uh, an hlp actor so can we call it a uh, uh, durable solution when uh, they are trying to include uh, to exclude uh, hlp ok maintenant tu peux passer au deuxième slide pour dire que face à ce tableau sombre nrc avec nous on a mis en place euh, cette note de plaidoyer pour amener et les partenaires techniques et financiers et les acteurs humanitaires et la société civile et les autorités étatiques pour comprendre comment est-ce qu'on doit impliquer le LTP dans de différents mécanismes de réponse humanitaire. Et donc, le contexte de la RDC, comme on le sait bien, est toujours déterminé par la compétition sur la jouissance et l'accès à la terre, sur l'accès aux ressources naturelles, l'émergence des conflits intercommunautaires, l'affaiblissement des services étatiques, le pluralisme juridique et des normes coutumières, y compris la violence causée par les groupes armés, suivie par l'insécurité alimentaire. Donc, toutes ces difficultés-là constituent le contexte de la RDC. Et voilà, lorsqu'il faut maintenant faire un plan de réponse à tout cela, on veut amener à travers cette note à tout le monde de comprendre la centralité du LTP pour traiter un problème comme je venais de le citer. Au revoir. And that's why uh, the HLP in, in DRC have has made uh, this advocacy note just to make sure that uh, all the partners uh, have a good understanding of, of what is uh, HLP and um, the DRC context uh, remains uh, determined by uh, competition over land and the exploitation of other uh, natural resources and the community uh, conflict uh, we can add uh, state service, services, uh, legal uh, pluralism, and uh, uh, customary norms. So the largest uh, proportion of the population in need of assistance is the is in the eastern part of of the DRC. Okay. Donc dans ces rapports, lorsque vous allez les lire, ou bien pour ceux qui l'ont déjà lu, ils vont constater que nous avions fait le parallélisme entre les différents clusters et le LTP. Et en l'occurrence, quatre clusters, notamment le cluster WASH, le cluster éducation, le cluster sécurité alimentaire, le cluster CCCM et le cluster abri. Donc, dans la note, nous avions montré que la réponse Lorsqu'il s'agit de développer un projet dans le secteur X ou Y, l'on doit tenir compte des besoins LTP. Au va. So the advocacy note uh, highlight uh, the need to take into consideration uh, HLP issues in humanitarian uh, re response not only in, in HLP sector, but also in other uh, clusters, such as food security, uh, wash, uh, education, and shelter. Donc, à titre illustratif, dans cette note, nous avions montré que le programme wash éducation exige des terrains nécessaires, des terrains sans problème. Et pour rechercher ces terrains, En tout cas, les clusters WASH ou les clusters éducation n'ont pas l'expertise. Et donc, même si ils ont réussi un fonds pour construire des addictions d'eau ou des écoles, on aimerait, et c'est cela l'attente qui est formulée dans la note, que dans le cas de la mise en œuvre d'un tel projet, qui est quand même un partenariat avec l'LTP, pour s'assurer que les terrains qui vont recevoir les constructions 
des cornes ou les addictions d'eau ne poserait pas un problème au finish, de sorte que le travail fait ne soit pas ramené à zéro. Over. And he was, uh, so uh, Pascal was highlighting uh, just an example uh, that HLP and HLP uh, a wash uh, or education uh, project might need, for example, to to set up uh, a water a water point or a school, and then before doing that, they need to acquire a, a land, and there is a a process uh, that needs to be uh, followed when you want, for example, to to build uh, something on on a land, and in most of these uh, step, HLP uh, might be helpful. So it's important uh, just to take into consideration uh, HLP even at from the design uh, from the design uh, stage. Par rapport au cluster sécurité alimentaire, nous avions démontré que la programmation en CECAL et même en AMB exige des moyens de substance nécessaires et une compréhension des relations entre les participants au projet et l'accès à leurs biens et à leurs terres en fait de permettre la création de moyens de substance. Et donc, encore une fois, C'est le GTLTP qui a l'expertise pour s'assurer que lorsque le CECAL, par exemple, viendra donner la semence, des outils aratoires, que cela ne sera pas vendu au marché parallèle. Et, et vendu pourquoi Parce qu'on a, au finish, trouvé aucun endroit où on va exploiter ces outils-là. Je vais aller rapidement pour que tu, tu résumes à la fin, parce que le temps file. Et par rapport au CCCM, l'on a démontré que les sites de déplacés et les camps, surtout au nord Kivu, sont en train d'être érigés sur des terrains qui n'ont pas été balisés en amont. Et pourquoi pas impliquer alors le GTLTP dans la réponse lorsqu'il s'agit de faire le monitoring des sites qui recevront le déplacé, les sites qui recevront Euh, recevront les constructions en abri. Même chose alors pour les abris proprement dit, où on a vu, par exemple, dans les Grand Nord Kivu et même dans la province de Tanganyika, où on est venu distribuer des abris aux déplacés. Et finalement, parce qu'il n'y a pas eu de terrain rendu disponible, les déplacés ont fini par vendre tout ce qui a été distribué en termes d'abri. Donc, c'est face à ce tableau sombre que nous avions produit cette note avec l'idée qu'on se rallie. Et une fois lui, nous osons croire que le GTLTP va hausser son niveau de visibilité dans le cadre de la réponse humanitaire, non seulement au nord Kivu, mais aussi dans les autres hubs humanitaires de la RDC. Donc, c'est cela l'économie générale de la note que nous avions produit et le fait en anglais pour permettre à tout le monde d'avoir une idée sur ce qu'elle contient. Brièvement, je dis merci à tout le monde. Le document est sur le site de NRC et nous allons aussi le poster sur le, le site humanitaire. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Pascal. Uh, just to uh, summarize uh, what you have been saying. Uh, so is that uh, if if uh, for, for example a uh, wash cluster for security a cluster ccm education um, take into consideration uh, hlp issues this uh, will increase the visibility of of uh, hlp uh, in drc over thank you trezor thank you pascal merci beaucoup um, and i've put the links to two of the reports that you've mentioned. If there is a question, I'm, I'm, I'm available for receiving that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, if anyone has questions or comments, uh, please um, yeah, feel free to write them in the chat or, or speak them out. Um, well, we'll wait to we'll see if people write in the chat. Um, but otherwise, uh, thanks, Pascal. And um, yes, the resources are in the chat, so please have a look at those. And this is something we're trying to support more. And I think it's really great to see 
um, a kind of clear advocacy note around why HLP matters, why it's important um, to keep getting that message out that people need to think about this, whether they're working on you know, direct HLP programming or whether they're working on shelter education, WASH. Um, so thank you for, for that and for bringing those to our attention. OK, um, so we're going to turn now to um, our colleagues in the shelter cluster who are working with the shelter cluster. Uh, Melina, I believe you're online and are going to give us a, an update uh, on some of the shelter and HLP work that's going on. Um, we have quite limited time left, so um, not to put any pressure on you, but yeah. <laughs> Over okay, to you. This will be uh, very quick. My name is Melina with IOM. Um, just to give a brief update on what we're working on with Shelter and HLP. First, we have the HLP Shelter and Settlements Toolkit. Uh, we did an initial consultation that we've been working on with the Global Shelter Cluster, and we did an initial consultation with HLP AOR coordinators and friends last week. Um, we got some good feedback, so we'll be editing the toolkit, and then we will have it go for a broader, more practitioner-focused consultation early next year. We're also working on developing an online format for the toolkit that uh, won't be hosted on the Global Shelter Cluster website, but in a more interactive and usable format. So hopefully the, the toolkit is easier to navigate. We also have developed the HLP and Shelter Land Rights Due Diligence Standard Update um, and a Shelter and Due Diligence Mini Manual. So those will go for a consultation with the HLP, AOR and Global Shelter Cluster early next year. We have the HLP e-course modules, which I hope uh, most of you have seen the four that we have already. And uh, the fifth one will be completed at the end of the year. <clears throat> Sorry, focused on uh, protection and climate change. Um, so that will be completed by the end of the year. And then early next year, we hope to do a more uh, focused dissemination of all the e-course modules, make sure that everyone knows that they exist, what they are, um, and can use them in their trainings and workshops. And then I just wanted to plug that we are planning the second international conference on HLP in DC. Um, it's part of a series. So the first one will be uh, a Puerto Rico dialogue on HLP in crisis context the week of April 2nd through 4th. And this will be held in Puerto Rico. And then following this, the week of May 13th, we'll have the second international conference on HLP in crisis con uh, context in DC. And this is the same week as the World Bank land conference. So we're coordinating and making sure that um, that that this conference complements the World Bank Conference and there aren't overlapping themes. So we're still workshopping the themes for both of the events and we'll be sending more uh, information on this to come. Um, any questions or comments or anything you have about these items, you can email me or also um, Ibera Lopez. Um, yep, that's all I have. I hope that was quick enough. That was quick and comprehensive. Thank you. So things to look out for then, uh, consultation opportunities in the new year next year around some of the tools and kits that are being developed around due diligence but also more on the HLP toolkit for shelter as well and I guess if people want to be involved in some of these the conference then then they can get in touch as well um I just put the dates in the chat just so for clarity um great well thank you for that Melina um yeah we'll have maybe next time we'll have a, a yeah more of a, a presentation around some of these um these areas and um, also we'll be sharing opportunities for you colleagues and others to be involved in some of the consultation around that. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for that, Melina. Um, now, Ludmilla, I'm going to turn to you now um, for a, a brief update on the resource you've been involved with around cash and HLP. Um, very relevant given what was discussed about Afghanistan and the use of cash programming in HLP there and particularly how it might impact uh, women. Um, but yeah, over to you for a, a brief update. Um, we've not got too long, so um, yeah, please uh, use your time. No, 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 I know. I know that the, the time is very, very short. I would like to start by thanking by thanking everybody who has contributed to the tip sheet. It's still, can you see my screen or not? Uh, yes, but I see a slightly big scary picture of my face um there it is oh, yes there we go yeah. all right now we, now we see the presentation we see the presentation yeah, yes i'm just going to present the contents because it has not been published yet so i'm just going to give you a very very short overview of this tip sheet the objective is to support people who work HLP in using CVA as a tool, cash and voucher assistance, that I'm going to call CVA to make it shorter. Uh, 
and to highlight the linkage between CVA and HLP activities and consider how we can better improve HLP programming using CVA as a tool. So the idea is that. I'm not going to explain to this audience what its tenure systems and security of tenure. And there are some many positive outcomes that were found about the linkage between CVA and HLP programming in literature review. And there are some, it's very important to have a very, very well done context analysis that must not be exclusive to economic market aspects, but consider also HLP aspects and cross-cutting issues such as gender and climate change, because women all over the world and Afghanistan people have just showed us how much they face gender-specific barriers to the access to land, right, and housing and resources, and also because climate change is a, another crisis Another cross-cutting issue, it's influencing everything, and it's very, very likely if nothing is done in the worst-case scenario, the level of displacement predicted is 1.2 billion people, and we'll have a big, a big trouble in the worst-case scenario, a lot of work to do. So these are cross-cutting issues and they are to be considered in the context analysis. And then there are the CVA, the HLP specific programming considerations like CVA for building for shelter. I, I put the building because we are going to see afterwards the lease or rent, but in case for shelter, for building the shelter, there are these examples of CVA for collective purchases of land that has been happened in Somalia, the Novadag project, cash for work, that is the case that I cite in the text in Sudan, cash for trainings for work, so the possibilities are many. When it comes to CVA for lease, rent assistance, we know that it can be either a deposit or any fee or duty or integral part of the payment. It has a, an impact on the local rent market. And of course, it does require careful consideration of local regulation. So it's a tool very interesting for HLP practitioners that are going to support with this local regulation and programs that work with legal assistance as well. Then we have cases also of CVA in support for relocation and resettlement. CVA in returns, the case that I'm going to use in the tip sheet is Afghanistan, how it's being used there. And also we have the integration with other humanitarian programming. CVA and livelihoods, HLP and livelihoods, CVA and civil documentation, because we cannot exercise HLP rights if we lack a legal identity document. Another issue that I find very, very important is that HLP and disaster risk reduction have a better coordination. In some places, it does have a great coordination of work, in some places, not that much. A good example is, for instance, Mozambique, where NRC is working with displacement in support, and it's providing good support of the disaster policy, because displacement is being dealt with there in the disaster risk and reduction policy. And finally, CVA and mine action, because of lands affected by, contaminated by mining, and there will be and a specific tip sheet for mine action, and we will connect with this. So these are the main aspects that will be covered. This work is finishing this month, and we are discussing, Save the Children and myself, we are discussing a continuation of this work, but it would be a capacity building about 
CVA for HLP practitioners. So if anybody has a suggestion what a topic or a process that you would like to see addressed, please reach out to me. Your contribution will be quite welcome. But this first part is the production of the tip sheet. And the next part is the capacity building for on how to use the tip sheet that we are still discussing, the TOR, and will be contracted afterwards. So for now, that's it. Well, thank I try to be short, Jim. Thank yeah, you so thank much. You. Thanks so much for sharing. And um, once the tip sheet is finished and um, um, and is ready, we can have maybe a, a more dedicated session and time where you can present the contents and we can have an exchange around that. Um, there's a question in the chat around cash for work. Um, so maybe you could try and write something there um, because we just have a few more minutes left and I, I want to hand over to Trezor to give us a, a brief update on some of the information management related work he's he's um, initiating. Um, so yeah, Trezor, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jim. So we are run out of time, so I will be uh, brief. Uh, okay, can Thanks. you see my screen? Yes, we see it well, Trezor. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. So here are uh, some IM uh, updates. So as you must already know, uh, most of uh, operations are, are in the humanitarian uh, program cycle uh, process. And uh, the main uh, challenge uh, during this uh, HPC process have been the lack of of meteorology in estimating the people in need and also the severity for uh, HLP. Um, it's important to highlight that uh, most of support requests that we have received uh, during this period uh, related to, to, the to the lack of uh, meteorology uh, for estimating the pain and severity uh, for housing land and, and property. So there is a need uh, to have uh, this meteorology uh, put in place. and. Here are uh, some ideas uh, just to have uh, this methodology uh, put in place. So the first idea was to set up uh, a task team that will develop uh, uh, that methodology. And um, this is just an example of, of the task that uh, this group could, uh, could uh, do. For example, uh, this task can be in charge of of the review of all existing HLP related assessment tools and indicators. Uh, this group can also define uh, the severity scale for HLP and indicators and so on. Maybe you you have been working on the same thing uh, with other uh, clusters, so you're welcome to join uh, the, the task team. We will uh, send maybe a separate uh, email uh, for that with uh, a more detail, but please free to reach out to me if you'd like to, to be a part of, uh, of, of this uh, task team. And also there is an opportunity to, to learn from best uh, practices uh, being applied in some other uh, countries because some countries might already have uh, a working methodology for pain calculation for HLP and other not, but uh, we would be also glad to, to have uh, uh, the experience from other uh, countries as well. And then uh, in some contexts, uh, the methodology for protection cluster might be uh, adapted. We had a call uh, last week with the information manager for the global protection cluster and he said that um, in some countries they tried to adapt uh, the protection cluster methodology and it, it seemed to work uh, when you have uh, MSNA household uh, data. But it's important to highlight that uh, this final HLP methodology should take into consideration the way to work with other uh, clusters such as uh, Shelter and, and CCCM. Yeah. Uh, so I, was, I, I would also to highlight that uh, uh, we are here to support. So Anytime you need uh, support, feel free to reach out to me, Jim, or Umbreta. So this is the available uh, support we can do. For example, we can support you during the, this HPC uh, process. And also if 
you are already thinking about uh, the response monitoring and this can be for, uh, for example the review of tools such as uh, 5w uh, matrix or you would like maybe to put in place a dashboard that will allow you to yeah just to communicate on your on your findings we can support you on that and and also uh, actually we are supporting uh, different countries in creating uh, hlp related uh, country pages on the relief web if you might already have uh, the page for HLP on a relief web, but which is not updated, we can support you in updating uh, this page as well. And also, if you need uh, any country dedicated uh, support, feel free to reach out to us and we can start uh, discussions on, on that. Over. Thank you, Trezor, and apologies for the um, slightly shorter time available. I think it's been a very interesting exchange today around um, various uh, different uh, geographic contexts. So um, yeah, sorry that we haven't had as much time as we could for discussing that. We will come again to the information management support in January. Um, and just a, a couple of uh, comments from myself as, as we close the meeting. Um, but just to say, um, so uh, yeah, next week, next year, we will meet early in the year to look at the the work plan that we kind of finalised around June, July time of 2023, and we will look at how we're doing, and we will also make some plans for next year, and that includes putting our meetings in place for these quarterly meetings, but also those to support our coordinators, and also um, develop some more sort of ad hoc webinar workshop type uh, gatherings as well. And um, I see a comment in the chat from uh, Reman who I, that I've tried to respond to, but maybe not done it properly. What I think you mean is, is there a way that we can sort of connect people who are working on HLP together and open up a, a space for them to, to dialogue with each other? I think that's what you mean. And let's Let's have a good think about that, because I think when the group's been smaller, we've been able to do that very easily. And then when we've got a larger mailing list, it becomes a little bit more complicated. But but yeah, um, I see your hand raised. Please do come in and, and say what, uh, what you're I, meaning. I, Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm not uh, going to take like uh, time. Uh, only I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking about like a list for, for the all the technical people from the HLP, let's say globally. We can have a benefit. Sometimes we have like to advise each other, to support each other sometimes, because uh, for sure now in Iraq, some, somehow we are like uh, in a bad situation related to the fund. Sometimes we need to have like a new idea. We have like some uh, issue with the climate change. Uh, those uh, uh, it's uh, those things is apart from the HLB somehow. So maybe we can have a benefit from this list uh, as like name um, any let's say channel of contact. And that's it. So yeah. Thank you. OK, yeah, well, thank you. So in the past, we've had like a kind of a, I suppose, a help desk list of of people where we can connect when there's an issue comes in and the AOR has kind of managed that process, I suppose. So, for example, you would raise your issue to us and we would then say, hey, have you talked to this person? And what I hear you're saying, I think, is that you would like a list where you can directly go to people and maybe, you know, you have certainly in the past and I've seen it in other areas like a, a Skype group or whatever, where people can pose questions and, and then respond. So. Um, that is something we can definitely look at um, and let's let's look at that in, in January and maybe discuss how that might work um, and how 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 we could do that. Um, yeah, because, you know, the mailing list now has about 600 people on, so that's too big for that. But there are some specific uh, technical issues that come up and we try and organise meetings to maybe workshop around some of those challenges, which can work quite well. But but it sounds like you're asking for a, that more direct kind of a way to communicate, which I, I think would be great. So let's look at that in yeah January, February next year and, and have a bit of a think about how that could work. Um, but thank you for that. It's a great, um, great comment and suggestion. Um, and, and, and that's why we're here is to kind of facilitate that kind of collaboration and engagement. So, um, yes, well noted. And please make sure you follow up if I if it feels like we're not doing that. Um, thank you. Um, so I'll just close by saying, yeah, next year we'll we'll meet again and look at uh, a bit of a plan. And I'd love to have you involved in in running sessions, in, in presenting your work, in uh, creating events, webinars, workshops as well um, and I know Ombretta uh, feels the same she's had to step out just for, for the final part of the meeting uh, but I, so as, as the coordinators we want to see you involved and we're really keen to do that um, so um, that would be great and I shared earlier just in the chat and was mentioned by Melina some conference things that are happening uh, next year there's also the global protection cluster conference 
um, which will take place in June, I think 10th to the 14th in Istanbul. So do put that in your diary. We'll share more about that as it comes up. Um, if anyone is around for the Global Refugee Forum next next week in Geneva, there'll be some of us trying to meet up, I think, on Thursday the 14th. So please do let me know in the evening. Uh, it'd be great to see you if you're there. I know that's an annoying thing to say for people who won't be there, but but if you are there, that would be nice to see you. And I hope to see some of you in other places soon as well. Um, Yes, so thanks all for joining. We'll be sharing a recording of this and the resources that have been mentioned. And uh, um, yeah, until we speak again, probably in, in January, um, have a, a great end of year. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for your contributions today. Uh, it's been very rich and interesting. So um, yes, please go well into 2024. And um, yeah, take care. OK, thanks so much. Thank you, Jim. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.